Um, so I'm Emily Manderson. I'm the conservation director at the Houston Arboretum Nature Center. And so I really want to talk about the idea of how to do restoration within a master plan process. So, um, which is a little bit tricky. And most of the talks we've heard today have also been about collaborating, that it's not just one group doing it. So this has also been an idea of a lot of involved people, a lot of cooks in the kitchen with different ideas. And um, so down here, I don't know if I have a laser pointer. These are just the, um, the design team that was part of this master plan process. So design workshop, they're the lead landscape architects. And before working at the Arboretum, I was um, on the Wildflower Center team for this project. So I was there during the visioning sessions and the site ass assessment. And so I got to have the opportunity to move from consultant into being client and ownership and implementing the pro process. So that was really um, been a great experience. So this is, they put together a big booklet with a vision and this is the cover of it. And, um, and I'll show you some of their other renderings, but we would always talk about, it's, it is hard to make these renderings. I had to do them in graduate school, but it's a lot harder to make the site look like the rendering. Um, so that's what we're in the process of doing. I think most of y'all are familiar with the Arboretum. Is that correct? Um, so really the main motivation for the master plan um, behind um, what got them thinking about their landscape was Hurricane Ike and then the culmination of the drought around 2009 and 2010 um, when it hit Houston the hardest. Um, so Memorial Park and also the Houston Arboretum lost about 50% of their tree canopy. And that was a big eye opener for the Arboretum itself and its relationship with the landscape. But the, it historically was a very passive management of the landscape. Um, and then it, they became aware that they needed to um, rethink how they were managing it. And a lot of the trees were dying and um, they were finding that this was kind of due to the pimples and dimple um, topography. And so they had in the master plan process, they did a really extensive site analysis and looking at the different components. And it was really the combination of the micro topography, the pimples and dimples, and then the soil complex. And they layered those things and found that majority of the tree canopy mortality happened in those areas that had historical soils and also with those pimples and dimples. So in the lower lying areas, the dimples is where most of the trees died. And that's where a lot of the trees had encroached over time and grown in. And so the vision of the master plan was um, how to increase landscape diversity and ultimately make it a more resilient site in the face of natural disasters in the future. As we know that nat natural disasters are probably going to be continuing, if not possibly increasing. Um, so the idea was at the time it was very much a monoculture. Um, we had one area, three acre prairie demonstration site, but the rest of it was pretty much overgrown woodland. We have um, the bayou at the bottom. Um, Buffalo Bayou, and then we have a tributary up here contributing to that. And then 610 is over here, and a railroad and Memorial Park is over here. We're 10% of Memorial Park. We're 155 acres, um, but yet we are a private nonprofit. We're different from Memorial Park. Um, we're not getting some of the huge funding that they're getting. Um, and so, so this was the vision uh, for the landscape component. And um, as you know, so things happened, uh, time, um, things happened in terms of funding, some of the things that we wanted to do, um, we had to reprioritize and think through things. The first, initially, when I first started, the idea was to have this big visitor center and event center, and um, it was gonna be very fancy Lake Flato. I don't know if you know those architects, they're kind of swishy architects, they were gonna do this, this wonderful building for us. Um, they are still doing our new administration building. Um, but because of funding, we had to rethink through things and we went back to our mission and our mission is education and conservation. And for a moment, I thought the restoration maybe not, was not gonna happen, but luckily that stayed in the play. And so this is what is happening as of now. There is still hope and desire to, and we greatly do need a visitor center and event center. Um, but that's probably going to be its own capital campaign. <laughs> okay. Um, and so these are the things that are happening. So I don't know if you have been able to be, we, one of the big things was we created an entrance off of the 610 feeder. 
Um, that was something the master plan really wanted to do, the design team, to give us more visibility. And you wouldn't imagine the amount of calls that we got. So many people, they're like, what, what is there? We didn't know anything was there. Um, so many people said, I've never even been to the Houston Arboretum before. I'm from Houston. Um, so it's really played a good role already. So many people are, are more aware of us than they have been before. And um, the way I think of this area, this is, we call this the 610 loop, but this is our woodland restoration area. Um, and then we have redone the woodway entrance. And so this is our new woodway parking loop. And um, the, we have some stormwater ponds, um, constructed wetlands. And then what the part that I have really, I'm pretty passionate about, I'm passionate about all of it, but um, the Savannah area, and this is the Savannah restoration. This will also be, um, right now it's currently laid down for construction, but this will be a great Savannah area as well. And so this portion is 15 acres, if not a little bit more. Um, and then we are, this is our current building. We are going to be building a new administrative building, and we're currently constructing right now our new conservation center. Um, that was one thing that I had to fight for. They wanted us up here, down here, on the edge of 610, and um, we did not want that, and so we had to um, negotiate that with the design team. And then this is also future um, part of the master plan, a nature playground. Um, so for children to be able to really have interactive, we don't want, we you know, didn't want swing sets and different things that you could get at a park. We wanted really these nature things um, where people can, on a small scale, they're going to highlight the different ecosystems within the nature area. And then also right now we're working on the ravine um, restoration. A lot of exciting stuff is happening there right now. Um, so just to go real quickly, um, these are some, again, the renderings of the idea, the vision that we're supposed to be living up to. Um, there will, this is much has changed, but this is going to be the connection between the current education building and then admin building. There is going to be a courtyard and we're going to make that an event space, um, but it, we're not going to have the, the walking, covered walking area. This is the, the design for the nature play area. So again, it will have our savanna, savanna um, woodland area, and this is really where they'll get out and a sandbox and everything, and then a water area going over a wetland feature. Um, the other thing that I love about this project and that I talk about a lot is that we get the opportunity to change perceptions and um, practices. One, the idea about people and the relationship to the environment, that we're not in a hands-off environment relationship anymore, or, or I, don't know if we, I don't know exactly, I haven't figured it all out in the big picture, um, are we always supposed to be interactive or are we just responding because a lot of damage has been done? but that we can't have a zero effect on our environment. We are part of the environment. I believe in that very strongly. I think that we are nature, and by doing nothing, that is a management choice. And so we did nothing for many years at the Arboretum, and then we got a many woody invasives, ligustrums, privets, yopon. I mean, well, yopon became aggressive and took over. So it's an opportunity for us to show that we can also have a positive effect. And, um, and that also we can show that not all development is bad for the environment or for ecosystem function. And one of the ways we're doing that is we're also part of the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Are you all familiar with that program? It is a green rating program similar to LEED. Are you familiar to LEED for buildings? Um, so that's really changed, transformed the building industry. Um, most buildings now are, even if they're not going for LEED to get the actual um, certification, they're um, following those practices and standards. Um, SITES is responding to that, that a lot of buildings are coming in or development is happening and they're leveling um, these areas but they're not thinking about the landscape and then they're calling their building very green. And so the idea is everything outside of the building envelope and that site itself, how can they make that more sustainable? And so it's a, a green rating program in practice. It's based on ecosystem function and it quantifiably measures how you're increasing ecosystem function. And so we are part of that program. Uh, the other exciting thing about it is it's elevating in the development mind buildings and infrastructures and then landscapes is bringing it to that same level. And so here in terms of context, this is the Arboretum within central Houston. 
And you can see that is an important piece of landscape. And because of, I really attribute it to our educational mission and also just that we're a nature center, we're targeted to be one of the highest scoring sites project in Texas. So we're really excited about that. Um, so to, I'm trying to kind of talk big picture and technical because I know y'all are interested in technical, so hopefully I'm getting to what you're wanting to hear. But the initial methods, what we did when we first started out, we talked to local experts, a lot of y'all in the room, um, and we had a big restoration charrette, and we went to a lot of sites. We came here, we went to Sandylands, we went um, Green's um, Bayou Mitigation Bank, and then also the idea was I wanted to start, we were, we were kind of overwhelmed by the project itself, and so we said, well, let's start out with some small successes um, and not have some big failures. And then we also um, really wanted to establish a long-term monitoring project. And here's where we are when we're, we went to the Greens Bio Mitigation Bank. This was one that was really helpful for us because finally we saw, oh, there's the design team's renderings, and that's what we're going for. And it helped us. Andy took us out, and um, we went with Harris County Flood Control as well. And we saw these pimples and dimples and saw the savanna and prairie um, ecosystem and the grasslands as this matrix. And um, that's Theo and Chris probably geeking out over a bug or something. Um, that's. And then this is also um, our monitoring program. So we did a, a fishnet over the site and um, have all these different random plots. And so we're looking at vegetation over time. And um, it's a very long, long multiple multiple year project that we'll be doing we layered on top of that a pollinator study and we've had every summer an intern for the past three summers this was our first intern and it rained pretty much every day that summer and um, I think he got mold on his forestry vest <laughs> um, but it's been it's been great and so these are the different partnerships that we've been trying to establish and get um, helping us with our quantitative understanding that we are truly improving ecosystem function. And so to get to our so small successes, so we had some pilot areas and we looked at our, um, our savanna area and our woodland area and focused on the woodland area. Clearing had been happening at the Arboretum for a long time with volunteers, but it was happening very sporadically in different areas, so what we decided was let's consolidate it in one area. We broke up the site into different management units based on the trail system, and so this we refer to as Unit 4. This is our woodland area, and um, so we put all our volunteers, our Eagle Scouts, and um, over, over a year's time we were able to clear that whole area out, and um, this is some of the volunteers doing just some of the manual clearing, and this is what it looked like. And we would go back in with the volunteers, we would let them clear, but our team would go back in and apply herbicide. So is that clearing of like invasives and dead materials, the drought, and everything? Yes, primarily what we had is um, a layer of woody invasive material. Um, that was pretty much the whole arboretum site. It was legustrum species, privet, and yopon, and we had some cherry laurel. So we had some natives that were also aggressive. Um, after, after we did that and opened things up, we saw a lot of re just natural resurgence on its own. Um, and American Beautyberry has come in and really filled in that niche. And um, we're, we were excited about that. We saw changes in pollinator and insect um, and a lot more activity there. Um, and then in the savanna area, this really informed us for the large scale. And I'm really glad that we went through this process because we learned a lot. One of them of which was um, walking the city through this. They had a lot of hesitation in the very beginning about our savanna restoration. And especially for us to remove larger living trees um, because we were going to need to do that to actually get a really good grassland established. Um, and so what we did, our steps were we did a mapping exercise, we did GPS and tree assessments, we flagged the trees ourselves, um, the ones that needed to be saved and not saved, and then we worked on the tree mitigation and clearing process. So this is the map that really started us and informed us greatly 
These are the trees that um, we had our arborist, Dr. Watson from Texas A&M. He came, and these are the trees that only the design team looked at. Um, they were um, 25 um, dBH of 25 inches and greater. So that's not all the trees at the Arboretum. And um, this also is the, um, this is a digital elevation model. And then we took the contours, which are typically um, one feet differences. We broke that down into, if you can see down here, 0.05 meters. And then we could actually read the site. As somebody else was talking about the pimples and dimples or the, the differences, it's really these six inch differences on the site that have a big impact on the vegetation. Um, so you can see here, um, the green spots are the higher spots and the blue spots are the lower wetter spots. We went out and mapped and assessed all of the trees ourselves. So this is the actual number of trees that were out there. Um, we did that for every single tree in our master plan area. We went out and GPS them all and gave them a uh, ranking and description and the city needed to have that information. And um, we did a really detailed assessment. Um, you, it's pretty hard to see the difference there, but the yellow ones are what we said we would keep, and the, um, the darker dots are the ones that we proposed to remove. Uh, for the Savannah area, we cleared with the Hydrax, and we worked um, very closely, interviewed some different Hydraxers, <laughs> and made sure that they understood our site. Um, one of the things about our site that's so amazing and wonderful is that it is an urban site, and it's had some disturbance for an urban site, but really the soils are great and it's, in, um, it's such a resource. So the, thing, the tricky thing about our site is that I see it as a, like a remodel. You know, you have to come back in and you've got all these great resources, but you don't want to mess up what you have. And so really getting people that understood that not only tree protection, I think people are understanding you need to protect your trees, but our soils, we really need to protect our soils. And that's been hard to work with contractors about that. But, so we got a hydroaxer that we liked and understood um, what we were going for. And so this was our clearing process. We did do some planting, which was a little premature because after the larger scale construction, a lot of those larger plant material got, got a little bit damaged. Um, but we saw, again, with very little interaction that nature was telling us that we were going in the right direction that um, um, immediately we saw a red-headed woodpecker, which is really exciting. Um, and things were coming up from the seed bank on their own. So then we took it a step farther where we did some treatments. Um, I, I've been kind of squeaky wheel with some of the, the design team. Um, they wanted to do, start out like something like 10 inches of compost and rototilled throughout the whole site. And, um, and I was even advocating that maybe we don't even need compost. Um, and so it came down to we did some treatments to test out the implementation strategies. And so what we did is we had three different treatments, one where we just seeded, one where we seeded with one inch of compost, and one where the compost was integrated with an air spin. And then we went out, we had quadrants, and biweekly did some monitoring. We didn't find any statistical differences between our treatments, um, but we did find that the one inch compost, the thing that won me over was that we had to water less. We didn't have to water as much as the area where um, it had been seeded. And then what we just observationally learned was that seed didn't establish very well in the wet areas and then the shady areas were problematic. So we knew that we were gonna need to use more plugs in those locations. And this is a picture of the, the seed. I didn't provide our seed list in this presentation, but we have that and I'm happy to share that if, if you wanna look at it. It's just a Savannah seed mix. Um, and then I think actually, I, that's, <laughs> I, I realized that I missed slides, but so this was our findings area. Um, everything established very well. And again, it was very helpful, not only to work with the city about it, but also to get the public um, aware of what the changes were going to look like and, um, and get comfortable. And so while we've had some people with negative feedback, of course, but m really mostly we have had really positive, great feedback, which has been good because I, I didn't know where it was going to go because I've had a lot of projects where people can get pretty upset. 
Um, so just to give you some, so when we started doing this at the large scale, site prep was really one thing critical that we took as the client. We went ahead and did this before um, working with the contractors and everything like that. We paid for the clearing to happen so that we could go out and then do our invasive species control. So everything would be ready when they were ready to seed and plant. Um, then the next step was putting in the infrastructure and utilities and then the <coughs> irrigation installation. Irrigation was another thing that I, I definitely was a squeaky wheel with the design team. Um, we didn't have any irrigation in the site at all previously. And so I um, negotiated that majority of the irrigation system is above ground and temporary because um, I didn't want to have all the trenching all through the savanna and the woodland areas. And we do have one mainline irrigation system so that if there is another drought and fear of fire, we can, we can use that. All of that water for irrigation is coming from our stormwater ponds. Um, and so that's, that's another good management technique. Uh, and so then the planting of the trees, a lot of trees we got from Trees for Houston and um, compost, they installed the compost and then they did seeding in zones and then plug installation. Some of our hurdles was one, getting that tree mitigation approval to remove these trees was huge. Um, I first put in a proposal for it and we got denied and then um, we qu kept working with it and I, I think really working with Memorial Park Memorial Park Conservancy was what um, got us where we needed to go and we got credit, um, financial credit for the restoration that we were doing. And so now we have so much credit that if we need to, we can remove more trees beyond the master plan, which is wonderful. And that's been a big shift in thinking. Um, and then getting, getting them to d simplify the design, um, that's, I feel like, been a little bit of my role, um, thinking through, we don't need huge trees, we can go with small trees, we can have a long-term process in this. Uh, field verification, the way the whole process of a design and implementation and construction, um, there's not much room for you design something in your computer and you put it on the ground, but there's actually a hickory, a wonderful hickory right there that you don't want to get rid of and you have to shift and move the road. Um, so th that, that was challenging um, to, to try to figure out how to be flexible with our design because this is such a site specific project. Um, just working with the contractors in general, um, you know, as much as we communicate and I, as much as I'm out there on the field, things happened. <laughs> Um, mistakes happened, equipment, there was damage to the site, unnecessary damage. Um, working with the tree and soil protection and just finding native plant material. There were so many great people willing to help us, but a lot of the problem was we, we had a general idea of what we needed and we had a general idea of where it was going, but knowing the timing and the start date of things. And so it was hard. We had some material ready, but we missed the window. And so it was really hard to organize ourselves and getting all of that material ready in time. And then also the master plan is one third of the site. And me, uh, my, myself and my team, we're all missing the southern portion of the site. We feel like we haven't seen it in so long and we're ready to pay attention to the site as a whole. And so one of the um, exciting, really wonderful projects that we did get to do was um, because the native plant material issue was, was hard and we're working with these contractors that have a certain way of procurement and checking off their box and making sure that they got everything that's been specified. Um, we said, well, we will grow a lot of this plug material ourselves. And we worked in partnership with a lot of people. This is Alan Brimer, who took us out. This is um, at the Indian Preserve, I think. That yeah, I feel like we went to the Indian Preserve, yeah. but um, or yeah, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Um, and uh, so we did a lot of seed collection. Um, we went with LAN on a lot of our team, went on a lot of groups collecting seed. And we ended up having, and we collected at our site as well, a huge amount of seed that we could grow for our plugs. We also purchased 
I always feel like Austin Powers when I say this, 100,000 containers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, we learned a lot through, I was like, are we crazy? Like we're already going through this huge master plan process and now we're like doing a nursery operation on top of it. And we partner with Memorial Park Conservancy and working with their greenhouse. And um, so also buying the soil and filling these, we tried to fill them with volunteer efforts. And within 15 minutes, I was like, there's no way we're ever going to get this done in time. So our contractors came and they, they studied us and um, calculated the time that we were taking and everything and then came in and finished it in a week. Um, and they were, they were amazing. They really helped us. Um, but I think, I think some of the things we learned is we probably packed it too tightly, is one of my guests. And, um, and then also the timing window again, um, some of this stuff was not quite ready when we put it in the ground. Um, and so we've kept some of the stuff in the greenhouse and we're now gonna be planting it now. And we'll be doing a lot of the planting, the, the landscape contractors, their methods. Um, our team didn't fully approve of some of their planting methods. So we'll be planting them and I want to monitor those more closely and make sure that we have some quantitative understanding of how successful of a process that is. Um, but we ended up seeding about 8,000 trays. I think about we got about 40,000 um, that were viable and worked and everything, and we have about 10,000 left to plant. And this is, we divided up the savanna into different parts. So these parts have been plugged. This has been plugged somewhat. This is part of our pilot area um, that is doing really great right now, and I have some pictures of that. And then now we're going to be plugging this zone in the fall uh, with the additional um, material. So the lows of this process, the greatest low was even with all of our involvement <laughs> and um, protecting of the site, they actually um, seeded the site with Bermuda. It was luckily a smaller, more contained area. Even talking about it, I f I'm getting sick to my stomach. Um, I was depressed for about a month. No, this is actually the Wildflower Center. This is Matt O'Toole, and he's coming and writing his field notes. Um, but uh, yes, I, that, was, that was pretty hard. Um, I, I cussed for about a month. Uh, <laughs> well, it was a subcontractor. It was the hydro seeder. Um, so it was a subcontractor to the landscape contractor. And it was uh, a big mistake. And they, I've had a lot of apologies. And so um, in that area, we had to scrape. And we're still applying treatments and pull, hand pulling. And, but we will be seeding that in the next week, hopefully. And then um, tree and soil damage, as much as even part of sites, there's these vegetation soil protection zones. You have them all fenced off, and um, a lot of educational material signage has to be put up. Well, this was through a vegetation soil protection zone. They were transplanting bald cypresses into the wetland that direction. And I stood out there the night before and talked to him where it was going to go. But the guy in the equipment, I wasn't there. He ran out 11 times this way through the savanna, unfortunately, by these three big pines. Um, so things like that happened. Um, those were the lows. Um, the highs are just uh, similar to the pilot areas. How quickly, one, how quickly the vegetation has just come in and filled, and then how quickly everything else consequently has responded. And the flora and fauna has just been, it's been beyond any of our expectation. And so I just have some quick photos just to show you, so if you haven't been out there, this is our new 610 entrance. It was put in in the winter in January. This was it a month ago. Um, and this is the interior of the 610 area that I, I don't know if you remember in the map, the interior loop. Um, this picture probably doesn't even do it justice. It's a really wonderful space to be in. It's amazing. Um, these are, this is our Woodway Pond. Um, this is it filled in. This is only a three-month difference. It's pretty amazing how rapidly it's changed. Uh, this is a, we call this our donor boardwalk. So um, you can buy a plank as a donation. Um, we're trying to shift from the benching program because we were getting out benched. We had too many benches. And um, so this was the idea of doing a donor boardwalk. All these bald cypress trees were transplanted from over here. Some of them properly, some of them through the savanna, unfortunately. Um, 
And then this is our display walk. This is an idea um, that the design team had. And it's like a major connector from the Woodway walkway to the education building. And the idea here um, is to have these very um, enhanced um, areas of the prairie. And it took me a while to, to get the vision here. And I did a lot of the hand laying out translating the design team. I even went to the emergency room because I overexhausted myself <laughs> in the middle of the summer. But um, a lot of the, his inspiration and thinking, I don't know if you're familiar with this book, um, there's some things about it that are, I think, a little bit off, but and as a whole, it's this idea of merging um, um, horticulture and ecology and thinking about plant communities and layering of things. And I'm really excited about that, and I think the role of the display walk is going to be a great educational tool. And um, I want to have some of those really key rattlesnake master and milkweeds there right in the forefront that we can talk about. And um, we're also trying to build up the plant sales on our site, and so we can have, have those things that we will then be selling. Um, then the savanna, a big portion of the savanna, we did not get to seed because we were getting out of the seeding window. It was getting way too hot. So we were supposed to seed this week, but Native American seed, because of the flooding, has not been able to get us our seed mix. Um, so we're just waiting on that, and then we'll get to seed um, the savanna, the greater part of the savanna. But this is the pilot area that we worked on starting three years ago. Um, but Really, we didn't do a broadcast um, seating in here. A lot of this was done by hand and volunteers, and um, this is what it looked like earlier this week. And it's, so we're, we're very encouraged. We're not gonna mow or seed this area. We'll mow it in the winter like we do the meadow, and then we'll seed it in the spring. Another picture of the savanna. Um, this was a, a boardwalk, another victory. They wanted to do a DG path here. Um, our, outer, our old outer loop, if you know the site well, was along here. And that had a lot of, a big damming effect on the site and we lost a lot of post oaks because of that. And the, the general contractors um, worked with us and they took this out of the design team kind of slowing things down process and put it through their own permitting process and they built it on, with equipment where they built it and drove on top of it and didn't do any disturbance on the side. So um, it's a wonderful boardwalk and I really, I really like that. And again, it just makes us a better educational area. We have so much more that we can um, educate about and um, the, the benefits are just numerous. And oh, I wanted to just, this is a really wonderful document that I can share with anybody who's interested in it. We have a um, person on staff who has a master's in ornithology, and she has been um, noting the changes in the bird populations due to our restoration work. And she's, just one little section here is about Savannah Prairie restoration success since 2016 and 2018. Um, just the clearing, um, there, uh, there is heavy um, use and breeding by red-shouldered hawks, and re record numbers of migrant ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, we've had an increase in breeding by red-headed woodpeckers. We have one breeding pair in 2017 and now two pair in 2018. Um, expanded hunting territory of wintering American kestrels. Um, we saw a Chuck Wills widow, a Merlin solitary sandpiper, Tennessee warbler, blue grosbeak, painted bunktings, Dick Sissel, sorry, and a bo Bubba Link. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of really exciting things. <laughs> yes. Um, and then just to, we're not done. We're, we still um, are going to be doing the admin building. We're doing the um, ravine restoration right now. We just installed um, our so southern bridge and are installing the northern bridge um, today. And then um, we will be focusing on the nature playground as the last step. Are there any questions?